Hey, everybody. Welcome to a brand new format of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pekulski. We know how valuable your time is. Sometimes it's not possible to get to all your favorite podcasts and listen from the beginning to the end. So what we've done is we've decided to create a brand new format that allows you to get all of the high impact habits, all of the most valuable information in just a short, condensed amount of time. And ultimately, when you hear this podcast, and you know how much you love this information, you have the opportunity to then go back and listen to the entire conversation with the guest. So I hope you love it. Uh, if you do love it, I would love to love it if you would subscribe to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, share this podcast with at least one person you know and love as we continue to spread this message of intelligent muscle building and ultimately using muscle building and intelligent movement to live to a ripe old age and extend our lifespan. So without further ado for me, enjoy the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. And so if you if you had someone who was over-breathing in running or over-breathing in an exercise environment where they're trying to perform a specific skill, would you mind walking us through what your thought process might be to start to change that behavior to one that was conducive to um, maybe being more apt in, in driving performance? Well, that, that is, it seems like a simple question, but it really breaks down into many questions. And there are all sorts of considerations in answering that, what seems like a simple question. Now, you said over breathing. So the first thing we want to do is to define what that is. What is over breathing and what's wrong with over breathing? And over breathing, would you like me to describe that briefly? Yeah. Uh, over breathing doesn't mean that you're getting too much oxygen, like a lot of people think. Over breathing means that you're overdoing the, the job. That is, you're dumping out too much carbon dioxide out of the system. Most people don't understand that carbon dioxide is fundamental to health. It's not a poisonous substance. It's a requisite substance. It's a required substance. Without it, you would die. We use carbon dioxide to regulate the pH of the extracellular fluids in our body, specifically plasma, interstitial fluids, which are the fluids that surround all the cells in the body, the cerebral spinal fluid, and the lymph fluid. And we regulate the pH of these fluids literally from breath to breath. And there are mechanisms, there are reflex mechanisms that govern that. And they regulate that pH on information that they receive from uh, inputs from the arterial system about the pH, as well as about carbon dioxide concentration and oxygen concentration. And then the fluids in the brain also, there are receptor sites that are very sensitive to the pH level, and it regulates the breathing accordingly. And it keeps it exactly in place at all times unless you get in the way of it. So if you have a habit where you start to ve ventilate too much and you give off that carbon dioxide, then you start moving into what's called respiratory alkalosis. You're too alkaline in those fluids. And you get all kinds of radical physiological changes with all kinds of deficits and symptoms that come from that, which are usually identified with something else, not the breathing. They blame it on something else, like stress or anxiety or my diet, or they blame it on something else. They have no idea that the breathing is mediating. So the over-breathing is where you're dumping out too much of that carbon dioxide that you need to regulate properly. Hypo versus hypercapnia. If you could explain that and then how that's, you know, maybe a situation like um, hypocapnia creating tetnia, as you just mentioned, if you could draw a line there for us and, and have the audience understand kind of how something like hypocapnia would lead to something like tetnia. Okay, well, hypocapnia simply means, as I mentioned earlier, it means carbon dioxide deficiency. It means respiratory alkalosis. It means your pH is too high in the fluids outside of the cells in the body. And the breathing is regulating this literally from breath to breath. It's extremely precise in the way it regulates that. And when it gets out of whack for whatever reason, or an organic reason or because of a learned behavior, uh, you get 
all, I have a, it is a huge list of physiological changes that occur. And one of them, for example, uh, is that you get a severely reduced blood flow in the brain. And you can get uh, some uh, studies report up to a 60% reduction in blood flow to the brain. Other, piece, other areas of the literature talk about 50%, 40 to 50%, but it's been reported up to 60%. But I think in the literature in general, it's agreed it's about 50% loss of blood flow in the brain in the matter of a certain number of seconds, not two or three seconds, but in the matter of, of 20 to 30 seconds. And that will compromise you extremely because when that blood is reduced, that means you, you're suffering with hypoxia. You don't have adequate oxygen to the brain. You don't have adequate blood sugar to the brain. You have all kinds of electrolyte changes that occur. You get acidosis in the cells and the neurons in the brain. They're, they're moving into lactic acidosis, not because of the exercise, but because of the way you're breathing. And now you're compromising the whole neurophysiological system as an example. And if you're doing a sport where you have to rehearse, you can't focus anymore. Uh, if there's any kind of emotion in the situation, it'll exacerbate the hell out of the emotion. But it doesn't just affect the brain. It affects the heart. You get coronary constriction. You get significant coronary constriction when you breathe that way. While you're running, you get coronary constriction. Is that what you want? You know, and you get tetany in muscles because you get oxygen deficit in muscles and you get tetany. And, um, you know, it's a tetany is a very common thing. Neurologists see people come in, they come in all the time with symptoms of tetany, and many neurologists will just turn them away, turn them away because basically there's nothing they can do. It's really a behavioral issue. That's not their expertise. There's nothing physiologically wrong. It has to do with how the person is breathing. Now, if you were to breathe this way and didn't know you were breathing that way, if you get a, a 50% reduction of blood flow to the brain, and you get all these symptoms like anxiety or anger that it can trigger, these emotions that can trigger, you can't focus on anything, you can't remember what you're doing, then what are you going to attribute to? You, generally, you're not going to attribute it to your breathing. You're going to blame something else. Oh, it's, my, it's stress that's doing this to me. No, it's the way you're breathing that's doing it to you. It's compromising the hell out of your physiology. What we do in our work is we focus on breathing habits that people have learned. And they're generally learned unconsciously. And those habits can be learned as a meditator. Those bad habits can be learned as a yoga person. Those bad habits can be learned as a function of your coach in athletics because he doesn't, or she, she doesn't know what they're talking about when it comes to the physiology of things. It can come from those kinds of things, but it also comes from endless things. Like uh, I remember I worked with an athlete who was a, a, a track star at UCLA, and he had surgery on his ankle, and he came out of uh, general anesthesia with real serious problems breathing. You know, he had to stumble out of it. And so he developed a phobia that was embedded in his breath, basically. So, you, I mean, you can learn it coming out of surgery. You can, wear, you can learn it by wearing a mask. You get lots of people with COVID masks who have learned dysfunctional breathing habits. They put the damn mask on, and what do they experience? Air hunger. Not everybody. A lot of people get air hunger when they put on a mask. A lot of people don't. You put on a mask, they get air hunger. What are they going to do? They take more air. And what do they do? They go into hypocapnia. And there's a CO2 deficit. And what comes from that? Symptoms. What do they blame the symptoms on? Maybe the COVID they have. Maybe on other things, but they don't blame it on the breathing. They think that taking those larger breaths were, was helpful. This is how these things are learned. Okay, so our, our work is on you know, has this person learned a dysfunctional habit? Under what circumstances does it show up? What's sustaining it? What's keeping it in place? What's the history of it? What symptoms is it responsible for? How does it retard? How does it um, reduce efficiency physically? How does it have an impact on performance at large, whether it's public speaking or whether it's, you know, diving off a diving board? You know, how does it affect performance? How does it affect health? How does it affect these different things, these habits in that person? Every habit has a specific history for that particular person. 
one thing that comes to mind is myself as well as my audience is aspiring for what we'll call high performance. And I've read one of your articles called Good Breathing, Bad Breathing. And I'd like to go into like, well, what defines good breathing? Is it, is it completely individualized? Or if you wanted to use breath as a high performance aid, right? Call it a performance enhancing aid. Um, is there some specific thought process or some specific knowledge you need, would need to have to directly apply that to using as, using it, breath, breathing as a performance aid? Okay, well, first of all, the real key to learn is to allow a system to do its job, to allow the fundamental uh, innate intelligence, if you will, of the neurophysiology of breathing to operate so that it, it does its job um, efficiently and well. And that's really about um, learning, you know, when you're not in a challenging situation, you learn, as an example of many things, how minimal the breath is, really, in the final analysis. So you hardly have to breathe at all to get the um, oxygen you need. It's just, you hardly have to breathe at all. And if you practice that, where you can, you you believe it and you experience it and you know that then when you get into a fight flight kind of a situation or into a challenging let's call it situation because uh, a lot of performance i mean it's not necessarily negative because it's just it's just very very high performance oriented and it it requires you know optimal physiology uh and so you want to go with the system. Now, we call this the chemistry of respiration. And then there's the mechanics of breathing. And these are two different things. And a lot of people, when you talk about good breathing, bad breathing, people think of certain kinds of mechanics as being good breathing. And then they don't know anything about the respiratory thing. They just assume that what good breathing is, you know, is somehow good respiration. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have enjoyed today's high impact summary. If you want to go deeper into any of the content you just heard, don't forget to check out the full length show that was just released. You can head over to muscleintelligence.com slash podcast to check out that in all of our podcasts. If you want to subscribe so you never miss a podcast, head over to your favorite podcast platform, whether it be Spotify, Apple, YouTube, any of the amazing places where great podcasts to listen to, you can head over there and subscribe. If you want to join our email list to get free information where I'm constantly providing value, I'm constantly providing insights into the information learned on these podcasts, you can head over to muscleintelligence.com slash learn to grab a free guide on ultimately living your greatest life. Thank you for being here. And as always, live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.